What is up, guys? Welcome back to the Comic Cave. We've got Sarajay here in the studio today. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, awesome work on the new upcoming uh, Kickstarter, Fourth Dimensional. Uh, congratulations on it being funded under 24 hours. I was actually, yeah, under 24 hours. It was really cool. Met it in there. It's awesome, dude. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you so much, and I'm super happy to be here. Yeah, thank you for being here and thank you for taking the time out. Uh, starting out, how did you like want to get in to be a cartoonist? Uh, well, I've been drawing and reading comics since I was a kid. I think the, the first comic I read was Calvin and Hobbes and then uh, Bone by Jeff Smith quickly after that. Uh, from there, it was just about like what, like drawing my own comics. I always drew like, you know, Spider-Man, Batman. Um, and then realizing that, oh, these characters aren't just from cartoons and movies. They're from like the comics and starting to read like superhero comics in my teens. Um, there was like a brief intermission there where I was led to believe like, oh, you know, comics aren't the best path for you. But then after like a year of uh, post-secondary studies, I was like, no, this is this is what I want to do. So I've been working on that um, adamantly since I was like 19 and now I'm 23 and I've got my first like trade paperback out. So yeah, uh, that's sort of like the, the brief journey there. That's awesome. So fourth, uh, fourth dimensional is going to be, uh, it, it's a collection uh, so far, correct? Of, uh, yeah. So we have, I think the first three chapters are going to be what's in the Kickstarter right there. Yeah. yeah. When when did you so start each? Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. You ask your question. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to ask when when did you start working on the on the characters? So I came up with Mon. It, I drew him in like a single drawing in 2019, and then um, I was really intrigued by the character, and I wanted to sort of figure out what's up with him. You know, I drew him, but it's this weird thing where you're like, well, like you know, I just drew what's there. I don't know what's what's any what um like any of the backstory is any of the world around this character and then it sort of uh started building in my head um for a while i was stuck in like that world building trap where you uh where you know you're you're get, you're going like too big into things and you need to like you need somewhere to, to pick somewhere to start and i eventually was able to do that um we got the first issue here this was completed uh last summer so last july and since then uh, between my classes uh, in school, I put up the issues two and three, and that wraps up the first story arc here. And now we have the collected edition here. So this is a preview copy. I've, I've printed like a small number for conventions. The Kickstarter version will be pretty much exactly like this, but it's going to be touched up in a few places, and it's going to have a whole bonus section. The main thing being uh, there'll be a lot of guest artist pinups and got some really cool guest artists in there. And that list is uh, growing. That is awesome. Name drop. <laughs> <laughs> Name drop. Uh, well, we got uh, pieces by Mark Laszlo, and I've loved Mark's stuff for a super long time. So, like, getting him was was like, like absolute dream. I also got uh, Juan Gideon, who's done like awesome stuff, like Jurassic League and Venom. I got Kevin Anthony Catalan, who he was he sort of he actually mentored me while I was working on the third issue here. So we uh, we went through as I was like working on the compositions and everything. And he was able to like give me critiques and everything there. Um, and he's going to be doing a piece for the book. Um, we got other ones like Victor Alpi, who just, he uh, just had his successful Kickstarter for the Hugh Marks. Um, and we got some more coming up, you know, Erwin Papa, who's done uh, a lot of stuff. He's running his Kickstarter right now for the Sewer Boys. So yeah. There's gonna be some more, and I think like I'll be able to announce those a little further down the line. Yeah, that that's a phenomenal list so far. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I was reading the back of it. I saw that you were giving a shout out to uh, my uh, Anthony Catalan. <clears throat> yeah, and I was like, oh man, he actually helped him out quite a bit in the book. It was pretty cool. Guy's uh, really knowledgeable. He is an uh, just amazing guy, amazing artist, and uh, there's some really cool stuff for him coming down the line. So I'm excited for him. So if you're trying to pitch the story to somebody or trying to pitch this book, well, how would you describe it? What would you tell someone? Like, you got some guys that are interested. Okay, what's this book about? What do you tell them? 100%. So Fourth Dimensional, it's about 
uh, this character Mon and this character Ava. So Mon is an extra dimensional fugitive. He's escaped to Earth. He's met Ava and he wants to live this simple life here. But he's brought all the dangers and oddities of his dimension with him. So you get to see encounters with other creatures and other fugitives that have escaped. So it's this urban sci-fi adventure series. Um, do we find out like later down the line? Do you have like why he was a fugitive? Because he seems so nice and so like mm -hmm. wanting to see the good in everything. World, and, yeah. But... <laughs> <laughs> no, hundred percent. Uh, <laughs> um. So how I wanted to start the story was to like put you uh, already at the point where Mon and Ava are friends, because that's sort of the crux of the story is, you know, it's going to be like this otherworldly adventure wrapped up in multiple dimensions. But at the very, at the end of the day, it's like, how does the, the relationship between these two characters who are vastly different from vastly different places, how does their relationship grow and change as their lives change? Um, so I want to start the story already when we've met them even in the the first volume here which is a brand new added prologue that like shows their initial meeting you see it right when they meet the story starts from there and once we have that like now that we have that established here and you get to know some of the world and the context in the next volume while we also continue like the story in the present we're going to get some looks into both characters past that's and especially with with mon's past is because that's like that was there's a lot of mystery there and the, yeah it, it's exactly what you said where it's this character who he seems so like down to earth and happy-go-lucky and a little like like naive at times and it's how like what crime did this guy commit to be imprisoned in like such an extreme way i i guess i'm i kind of think it's interesting that you said you fell into the world building trap um because reading this it feels very much like the characters are the central focus. So I don't know if that was intentional because it was getting too big, but it just, it feels like at the core, it is these characters and the world does feel very fleshed out, but it's still the characters at the core. Yeah. Yeah. I really appreciate that. And yeah, because um, I think when you're creating a story, you think about, well, what's more what's most important to this story? Because there's no one right answer. It's, it's either the plot or the characters. And for me, um, I really love stories that have like sort of like these deep fleshed out characters that are really um, developed over the course of the story and you get like so many different sides to them. Uh, so that was what I want to tell. Uh, when you're thinking about the world though, it's so easy to get like stuck in that trap because you're not, you're not drawing it. You're not like committing anything down to paper. It's, it's a lot of it is in your eye is in your head and what you write down, like maybe what you type up or something, at least for me. And um, once you sort of get into that rhythm, uh, you're, you're coming up with uh, the details for things that like readers would probably never even see, you know, like, Oh, what, what does this character smell like? You know? Um, so it's a comic book. There's no, there's, that doesn't matter here, but um, yeah. So thinking about, just just pushing past that and being and especially uh with the stuff that'll come later you know you get uh you can like get so lost in the stuff that'll come down like at like the 75 percent point of the story and it's like i need to draw page one here so setting that all aside and being like that that's there but let's work on like just just getting these characters like making them real and like giving readers something that that like it makes the characters real for them yeah, and you drop in little snippets here and there that actually do that. They the action, their stuff's building up, and then you pull it back a little bit. I was commenting on reflect and reflex. <clears throat> I thought that oh, that, yeah. that to me, I thought that was really well inserted, and it came at a really good point. Um, so it, it's just uh, that, and then your nightmare sequence, uh, just the little things that you were dropping in here and there. Um, what stories? you know, do you read or what, what were some of your favorite comic book story arcs that you were just like, dang, I really like that. I, I want to pull something from there because that felt a little like, um, uh, who was it? Uh, Scott McCloudish, like the way he does. Oh, cool. Yeah. Stuff. So, or, um, the Jeff Lemire, the blue book, kind of something like what they did there. Um, but what were some of your influences for this, for this, uh, for your story? Yeah, because I definitely enjoy like stories that have a variety of tone. I think there's there's more and more coming out now where like stories will very naturally wrap in comedy, romance, action, like a little bit of horrors in part, you know. Um, 
So for me, some inspirations, I think a lot of the image stuff does that really well, especially like the newer image stuff. I think Rumble, it's a little bit older, but it's, it's an example of that where this it's this comic that has a lot of sort of like these like uh, elements of comedy, but then like, you know, these gnarly creature designs and like this like crazy bombastic action. Uh, so, like anything James Heron does, I think has that element because Ultra Mega is uh, like the same thing there where it's like this sort of cosmic horror and then just sort of like really dark comedy mixed in. Um, so a lot of like image books, uh, Madman is is another favorite of mine. And I think that's just for like, just pure fun kind of advent- action adventure comics uh, that like have such a unique spin to the creator's taste. You know, like there's no, there's no like adventure comics like Madman. And that's, that's the types of comics I enjoy where it's, you know, you're getting to see the creator's vision, you know, touch something that like you've seen, you've seen uh, adventure stories before, you've seen superhero stories before, but you haven't seen Madman before. Yeah. Oh, it's totally all red. Like I feel like nobody could Mm -hmm. quite like him for sure. Exactly. It's, it's, it's his, it's, he's created a world that's like perfectly suited to what he wants to tell, like the stories he wants to tell. And that's like what I want to do myself with fourth dimensional is create like this universe in this world that's perfectly complemented to what I want to draw and what I want to write, you know? So like, like funny characters, sometimes like freaky looking characters, um, the rate, like Mon's race of people, like the light dwellers, as you can see in the book, uh, the different, the different like fugitives they encounter, they have very, like a vastly different range of like design. So this race doesn't have, aren't like um, stuck to a certain like general appearance, like humans are like most animals we know in real life are. Um, And that just gives me so much freedom, even going in the future as I want to, you know, uh, develop new characters to have like so much range with them. And I'm not limiting myself now. And it helps keep it distinct too. Like it's easy Mm -hmm. for the reader to tell what character is which, which is really cool. So I noticed in uh, some spots, uh, Mon has clothes on and then he doesn't have clothes on. Is that just like, a, that's his look? He's just, yeah. he doesn't need clothes, right? So it's just over it. He'll wear clothes because he's come here to this human world. And most of the other like dwellers haven't really worn clothes, but he will. And um, he'll wear like human clothes, I mean. So I think it's something that I want to show like in, po- in points that he wants to. Uh, be closer to the human world and also some days he just wants to wear a jacket some days too hot whatever and I think it's something that there'll definitely be more of in the next arc uh, I want to sort of uh, get Mon codified like in the third issue just sort of like his standard appearance as you like you might have noticed from the first issue to the third his uh, proportions really slim down and he becomes um, I think like a it's a little less just sort of like standard proportions because he's got like really wide shoulders, really tapered waist. Um, get, like I want to get all that down just like at his base. And then in the next arc, it'll be easier. Like he'll probably be wearing like all sorts of different outfits in each issue. In a, a few of the issues he was, uh, or a few of the panels, I saw he was red at one point. Mm-hmm. Was that like a, like a sequence that he was supposed to just be red or is he going to be like color changing? Because I see he stops changing colors. Uh, so with fourth dimensional, I wanted to uh, change up my color approach from like the standard like sky is blue, grass is green. I wanted to use uh, really non-literal colors, and that really came through uh, with Mon, especially in the first issues material, because that one I was doing a lot of experimenting with my um, with my visual style, and the, and I figured out a lot of stuff uh, that I used through issue two and three. But those non-literal colors it let me focus on building like a pleasing color palette without worrying about, um, oh, is this like the literal color that this needs to be, you know? Things can be any color as long as it looks good. And then I can also use use colors for uh, emotion. So to like, if, if like there's this moment of like high intensity, like it'll be like basked in red. Um, Mon himself, I think I enjoy the idea of it being, he doesn't have like this sort of canonical color. He's really like, I, you gotta identify him at some, at some color at some point for consistency and like for this first volume i built this palette around him like with this blue color but you're going to see him like a lot of different colors like in the next arc it's going to have like probably its own color palette and he might be a different color there 
It's just this thing of like non-literal colors. And I was really inspired by Hirohiko Araki with his colored pages for Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, where he talked how his characters don't really have like canonical colors unless uh, like stated. And it lets him for each of the title pages he would do have like wildly different color palettes and have so much like fun exploring that. Ooh, okay. That's awesome. Um, I was wondering if we could switch it up to your process a little bit. Um, of course. I was curious, like, so it, it seems like you're obviously very thoughtful about this and you're, you're doing it all yourself. So when it comes time to sit down, put pencil to paper, are you, are you going in with a full script? Are you doing it page by page spreads? Like, how do you, how do you break it down? So I think I'm, different than what I've seen with a lot of uh, cartoonists who write and draw their both work. I think a lot of write, uh, other cartoonists, that, like the advantage they'll talk about of doing both parts is that their process is really organic. And, you know, they'll be like basically like going right into the drawing, writing little notes. And my mind, mind just doesn't work like that. I mean, like my writing brain and my drawing brain are like completely separate uh, parts creatively. So I need to write down and like, like to get ideas flowing for me, I need to write down like a full script with like, and, you know, start getting down dialogue. Start like I start with like plot points and build the dialogue and then start like fleshing it out. And once the script is at a point where everything's sort of working for me, like everything from the gags to the uh, big moments of impact, they need to work in script form before I'm like confident that I can, I can execute them. And I've had people say like, Oh, that's actually like a good thing because a lot of, Art, uh, of those cartoonists they can um get into the drawing before their ideas like really tightened up and like they like it feels like they might have been like over eager or something and at least with me i want to like as i'm developing here just make sure uh my ideas are like as best as they can be and like my my plot points are as best they can be before i've committed them to the page so yeah i, I write a full script out then i do my thumbnails uh, I pencil so, like I still switch between penciling traditionally and digitally just it's all with a blue line pencil I think digitally like they both offer their own advantages for penciling traditionally it lets you it's you have a physical page in front of you so you're drawing on like an object you know which is like like it's obvious when you're drawing digitally it's such like this abstract connection because like the page can be like it can be like you can zoom into the pixels or you can zoom out to like it's like a postage stamp you know when you're drawing on a physical page you can figure th little things out. I've had, and I have a specific page I can show, but there are instances where I figured something out just because I saw it on the page here. So for this page, and it's one of my favorite like compositions, is um, the sequence here where you see him looking around a tree, and then you go here, or you see him looking around a bush, and then this tree becomes the edge of the panel. He's looking around it, it wraps here, and then you see the tree that he's looking around. But then the crying of this baby wraps fully around through the three panels into the baby's mouth. And originally, in my thumbnail, this was three separate panels, you know? They, they had, like, no connections to each other. And I'm like, oh, wait. If, you know, I have this tree in the background here in my thumbnails, one can be looking around it here, and that can be, like, the panel, have that bleed here. And it's just things like that where... And then having the crying wrap fully through the three panels to, like, draw your eye through the sequence. Things like that. Um, I have these like little eureka moments when you're able to like see how things fit physically on an object. Uh, digitally, the the advantages are if I draw like a perfect figure, but I, I drew it like half an inch too far to the left, I don't need to erase it fully and try and like redraw it and be like, oh, it's not as good, you know? Digitally, you just move it over. So both have their advantages depending on the page. Uh, what that page needs, I'll switch up my process there. But in the end, um, whether I pencil it traditionally or pencil it digitally and print it out, I'm inking it digitally, then I scan, or sorry, inking it traditionally, then scan and color it. Phenomenal. That's so cool. I I, I suspected you might work full script, but I just, yeah. thank you for sharing that. Yeah. For sure, yeah. <clears throat> for that, uh, that, um, Little teaser video that was made. Did you make that? The one, the music, the animated one. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the music is yeah, like it's this. It's the Strokes, but I fully animated that that myself. It was for a uh, school project, and I 
complete like the brief was to uh, animate like a science related video. And I completely just twisted the brief because uh, I want to be helpful to what I want to do. So I'm like, instead of like, man, screw the science thing. I want to make like an animated sort of featurette of fourth dimensional. And my teacher was like, okay, man. So I went ahead and did that. And just to uh, get down sort of the idea of like the first issue in like a quick form. And I like, it was pretty fun to, um, uh, do that in like with like limited animation and make it hopefully feel feel like properly animated i looked a lot at like anime and stuff which at certain points can um really guss up how how animated it looks like or how how complex it looks when in reality it's like really simple animation for like these uh, specific sequences uh but yeah so that was all done by me it's fantastic, man. It was like a music video you'd see on MTV. <laughs> the way you, <laughs> it was just, you had the music synced up so perfectly and that song fits mm -hmm. so well for this book. Right. Thank you. Yeah. It, it started being like my uh, temporary, like my temporary song because I wasn't sure if um, I'd be able to use like, like, a, like copyrighted music like that. And then uh, it just like, as I was like getting farther along, it was like timing so well with things. Um, and I was like, this is just, it's gotta be it. You know, I'll, like, it's fine. Like, I, I hope it's fine because I make zero money from that ad or from that video. So, but yeah. You should be fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. You'd hope so. You'd hope so. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think when I, when I posted on Instagram, I got a little uh, notice that uh, the, oh, this video won't be shown in certain places because it's has copyrighted music and it said it was in Russia. So I guess, uh, to all my Russian fans out there, my, my, like, my, you know, that vast, vast number of people, they won't be able to see this video. <laughs> this is, uh, you mentioned again about um, doing something that you wanted to do. And then you also talked about earlier, kind of going back to when we were first uh, introducing ourselves, you said that somebody had kind of told you this wasn't a good, you know, route for you to take. I'm interested, man, what were you doing before or what were you doing that? segued you into this back into this or oh, back in. uh so this was oh sure so um yeah just being in school i think like through high school i was in, I was in a pretty academic high school it was all about like like wanting to get its students into like like uh, a place of high like high academics you know like your like law sciences all that um and i think with my parents as well and like um they they just wanted to see something that like was like guaranteed to make me money or whatever and i went into my first year of university uh in studying sciences with like, like specifically biology and i was in that and it was like it's so much work and the only thing i'd want to do with a biology degree because i'd you know i'd rather die than be a high school biology teacher is be it like i was like maybe i could be a doctor but like that's gonna be another 10 years of this and you know, it's it's not like a cakewalk to get into med school or whatever. So it's like, well, if I'm going to be committing so much time to something to and and it's going to be like hard to do anyways, why aren't I why aren't I drawing comics? Why aren't I doing that? Because at the very least, there, I feel I have a better chance. You know, comics are hard to get into, but so is writing the MCAT or whatever. So, yeah, from there I switched into arts, and then I found a a uh, much better program the one i'm in now it's a like a design and illustration program taught by industry professionals uh and yeah that's helped me a ton with with tightening up my craft especially my design ability and to be able to like design nice books and and like sort of like uh different pieces like that so do you feel like you're a bit of mon where you're like escaping a, a dimension that wasn't just for you. Like you're, you're, you're doing what makes you happy. You're late. You're trying to do something else instead. Mm -hmm. That's like, actually an interesting. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Or, or, or is there another character that you feel you're like, you know what? I write more of myself in this sort of world. I think they're like, you hear a lot of uh, writers and stuff say it, but like, it's, it's this thing where like all the characters are a little bit of you. And I think because uh, even with like Ava, she's like, like I'm 23 and she's like 19. It's something that like she's 
just a, like a few years behind me age wise and, and like sort of like experience wise where she's like just graduated high school or whatever um, that it, it becomes like uh, you really got to like look into yourself to find these experiences to write it uh, for your characters. And there, there, are, there can be these points where it's off, it's like subconscious and you aren't realizing like, like connections like that, where it's like, Oh yeah, well, you know, I guess I'm pulling from somewhere for these, for these feelings and stuff. So yeah, I think I'd need to talk to like a therapist or something before <laughs> I can identify the exact thing. But like, <laughs> I definitely believe because this is this is uh, something that like many creators and stuff will will like people will be able to point out in their work connections between their lives and their work. So with that, if is there any existing comic book character other than what you're doing here that you wish like you know what if I could get a stab at that, I'd love to do that character. I have a story I have in mind for that character. Mm-hmm. That's a really good question. And I think I've been so um, like gunning it with fourth dimensional because it's sort of like the project that I've been taking with me in my, in my journey to break into the comics industry. But I've had moments where I've like, like come up with like other premises for stories that I've been into. And that was just good to know because I'd been developing for developing fourth dimensional for so long that I was like, do I, can I create anything else? Like, I hope this isn't like the only story I can come up with that is, is like any good. And I've got with several other premises and I started drawing like stuff, uh, stuff for those. And they got me excited as well. So I'm like, okay, no, cool. If like I ever want to switch it up from fourth dimensional or once it's over, I think I got like a lot in the bank to, to work on, but nothing at nothing to the point where it'd be like, worth sharing because they're like it's 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 like ideas down paper and like a couple of sketches here and there it's like uh throwing out tarantino should direct deadpool all right dude we're gonna happen let's just keep moving yeah. <laughs> but that, that's what it seemed that's why i was curious because of the way that you were kind of drawing out the world it and i read the back um your little editorial your your letter which you were writing and it, mm-hmm. it, it was interesting for you when you were talking about the mass world that you were creating and you reduced it down to its its start and i think at least the three of us we appreciate it when cre- uh, creators just drop us into the middle of it sometimes mm-hmm. we don't get all the exposition we like to figure it out as we go along um so i was just curious if you had thought of anything else or you were just like hmm if i ever have a chance to do this because again the, the way that you're building the world so far is very uh is very careful yet it's really um well paced that I'm like, yeah, this guy's got it probably uh, like maybe thought of, I don't know, uh, a Hellboy story or some shit like that, you know? <laughs> like you oh, even with like other characters and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think, yeah, when I, when I sort of, when I was 19 and I wanted to, um, and I, I knew I'm like, I want to be a comic artist. I think the, the dream at that point was like, oh, I want to draw Batman. You know, I want to be like Batman <laughs> artist. And then as I started kind of doing it, I realized like, like working to better myself as an artist to do comics. I was, I realized I'm like, I don't want to draw Batman. I want to draw like my own characters. You know, I want these like to have like this sort of personal connection with these characters and it be like fully my own world and for it to be like fully my own thing and to not, um, I don't know. I feel like with any established character first, you need to, you're fighting against sort of the nostalgia of fans, which, you know, that's like what floats the, the sort of mainstream industry is, is, is the nostalgia of like the uh, of fans. So you can't like try and destroy that. Um, but then also you're, you're competing with like the 20 best Batman artists or whatever. So it's like, who wants to be like the 500th best Batman <laughs> artist? No, I want to be like the, I want to be the first best Mon artist, you know? Yeah. So that was part of it. And then uh, to your other note about dropping in the middle of the story, I just have a quick thought is that I'm glad you said that because when you're sort of writing a story and I have um, an editor and I'll be talking to her and you, you often get the thought of like, man, like I didn't sort of make this abundantly clear. Will people get this? And I think I would just be told it's like, listen, people will get it. Like you, you've set it up here. And, but there will still be people who will be confused because you can like do everything to try and like, like idiot proof 
your story, but there'll always be like a chump who comes along. It's like, how does, what happened here? Whatever, you know? Um, so yeah, I think that, that's, it's good to hear that like you have an appreciation for stories uh, that, that don't, aren't like holding your hand through it and you can like pick up pieces throughout like little hints and stuff. Well, when you do something as intimate as this, I think um, giving the audience enough credit that they can understand it is very important because again, it gets us, it gets, you know, us to know, yeah, it's a conversation and it also gets us to know you a little bit more and your style and what you've been doing. So um, yeah, I was stoked to uh, talk with you because I liked the story. I liked what I was seeing and I was like, dang, dude, this kid, this guy's got it. Like it's pretty legit. Um, you're saying like 23 and I've been working 2019. Like, holy shit, dude. Like that's actually, that's, that's a lot. Yeah. That's a, that's a little <laughs> you're, bit, you're but that's a lot doing, of work. You're doing and you're fantastic. doing it. You're doing, fantastic. Yeah. That's you're doing, dude, doing, but, you're um, doing it all. Yeah. You're doing it all. And that's not an easy task at all. So yeah. So yeah. yeah there's that respect factor too, man. So um, thank you very much. Yeah. Good man. Yeah. yeah. Um, other, other than the Kickstarter, where can people find your work and uh, what's the best, like social media and all that? So my biggest uh, social media platform is definitely Instagram. So, and that, but then I'm also on Twitter. So you can find me on both those uh, at Sriracha Art. And then I'm also on Facebook because I think a lot of like, uh, say older comic fans are on Facebook. And I didn't realize because I hadn't been on, like I sort of dropped Facebook when I was like 10 years old. Um, but Facebook's thriving, I guess, for comics. Yeah. So I went back on Facebook and find me just, just I'm Siraji on there. Uh, yeah. I have like online stores once the campaign's over and I've had my uh, copies of the book printed, I'll be like, ha I'll have it available there. But yeah, the Kickstarter right now is sort of the main thing I've been like pushing just, just because I want to make this as big as I can. Um, if we hit like these uh, remaining stretch goals, it'll make the book even better. We've, we've passed the first few stretch goals, which it's like, oh, you get like the little bonuses, you know, stickers and prints and whatnot. Um, the stretch goals we're approaching now, the first one will be to add uh, more pages to the book uh, with like uh, added illustration section to the bonuses. So you'll get like that, that added to the back as well. It'll be all the like non-comic illustrations I've done for fourth dimensional uh, over the years. So including, I think like I'd want to include all the key frames of the animation in there because otherwise um, a lot of these illustrations, they, you won't be able to see them in like a nice, like one spot. So having them in the book would just be super cool. So that's sort of the next stretch goal. Uh, the one after that is for more guest artists and that that'll just be cool because you want to pay these artists what they're worth for, uh, for sure. And when you want to get like these artists who are like really cool, you need to pay them a little more, right? So having that as a stretch goal, let me get a few more guest artists without bankrupting myself completely. <laughs> <laughs> um, you plan on doing any like convention circuits for it? So I've done, uh, in since I've done the first issue, I've been doing a lot of conventions in Vancouver, where I'm from, I've done, like in and around Vancouver. Uh, my goal with this next year is to do some conventions in the States and because i'm from canada and like i haven't done that before i'd want to like start with just a like a smaller handful so i'm going to be doing uh hopefully the, the ones i have in mind are emerald city comic-con since that's in seattle and that's pretty close and i could just sort of drive down there and also that just seems like a really amazing convention there's so many great artists there and the other one is uh uh Hero heroes con yeah. so that was this last june and i have like so many artist friends like every artist i know went yep. to heroes con yep. and so many of them like, like were connecting with each other meeting with each other in person and making connections with uh different industry people and i'm like damn i need to get in there this is like this looks great because it's also a convention where like the huge emphasis is on the artists and any convention like that it's an instant win definitely definitely yeah we're actually when you're not fighting when you're not fighting the funko pops or whatever for oh, attention yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, that's our goal next year is to try and make it out there. <laughs> yeah, because that that's what we've been told. Like that's that's the artist's convention. Oh that's yeah, the, the stories just sounded amazing. ECC well, is really good. ECC is yeah. good too. Um, well, Lightbox Expo is too, but yeah. that's more less comics. Yeah, less more comics, illustration. more artwork, illustration stuff too. So, um, but damn, well, man, we we really, really, really hope that you keep hitting more goals. 
um, keep hitting those stretch goals. And uh, we hope that you do come make it down to the States. If you uh, decide to do WonderCon also, we'll, uh, we're right around the corner. So. <laughs> oh, super cool. I'll have to keep that in mind. WonderCon. Anaheim. So. Right. Uh, well, hopefully we can see you at Heroes Con. That's our goal to try and get there next year. Um, Amazing. Do some more out of state conventions as well. So, yeah. Thank you for your time, dude. And uh, <clears throat> fantastic work. And I uh, yeah. can't wait to see more of it. And follow him on his Instagram. Yeah. yeah. Fourth Dimensional. Fourth guys. Dimensional. Pick it up. Yeah, please. Wait, thank you so much. Thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> for taking the time right. with us. All right. We're out. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Bye.